Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church, and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. So what is vision? Um, vision? Uh, a vision. A vision is... What is vision? Vision is... When I think about vision, I think about... Well, I grew up on a gun range, so like shooting a whole lot. If you know what your target is, then you're more likely to hit it. So vision is having a good vision, is having a good target. The point of reference of the direction that we're going in. Being able to see, uh, see through the obstacles um, clear enough that you can see the end goal. And then to move towards that. You take incremental steps to get there. Painting a picture of where we're heading in the future. Bringing forth the future into the day. It's seeing what is ahead of you with such clarity and confidence that you can boldly pursue it. Morning. I can see, I can see you guys love the time change. Uh, Last week, we uh, covered the very first of four vision items that were in our church's uh, vision statement that we rolled out earlier this year. And what we've been doing is, is looking at, and we're going to continue this, looking at the Bible for where the Bible speaks directly to uh, some of the things that we believe God has called our church to do in the coming years. And so last week, we took a look at why we gathered together. The, the idea that the Bible says we, we actually gather together to stir one another up into love and good work. So, so we don't come together for some sort of religious experience. We don't come together because somehow like God is more honored you know, if you go to church and you put on a suit. and uh, We come together because the Bible says it's our job to consider, to think, to strategize about how to stir each other up, encourage one another so that we'll love Jesus more. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a second uh, item in our vision statement. We're going to look at this idea of what it looks like to reach our circles. Everyone here has a circle of influence. You have people that God has providentially placed in your life, and you are potentially the only person who will ever speak the truth of Christ to them. And the Bible's going to talk about what it looks like to love people perfectly today. And so we're going we're gonna to go through this story. Jesus is going to tell us some things, so just universal truths about human nature. And we're going to learn three gospel principles about love in this story. So join me in Luke 10. You're going to start in verse 25. I'm just going to read you this story. It's a fun one. It says this. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. He's talking to Jesus now. He's saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. 
But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. There's a big idea here that we're going to get to at the end or by the end. And it's this, the, the, the desire to reach people, the desire to love people is a natural symptom of loving Jesus. Lacking it should alarm us. So it shouldn't make you feel guilty if you don't have it. It should actually warn you. It should alarm us. We're going to look at that. We're also going to look at three gospel principles of a love today that Jesus is going to show us in this story. Now, I believe that reaching people with the gospel is an act of love. And loving others, especially those different than us, is actually what happens to us and in us and through us when we personally experience the grace and mercy of Jesus. So I think there's a misconception uh, in, 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 even in Christian circles that spiritual maturity is somehow uh, knowing more. Well, I've studied more or I've gone to more classes or I've been through more Bible studies. But in, in reality, spiritual maturity is growing in our love for Jesus to such an extent that, that how we see Jesus, how we experience Jesus, how, how we begin to love him spills over. It overflows into other areas of our life and it becomes unavoidable for the people in our life. It's contagious. In fact, maybe if you've been on the other side of this, maybe even a little annoying. You're welcome. That you love Jesus so much you can't stop talking about it. Reaching people, caring for others, even strangers, is a symptom. So, so understand why this is so important. Symptoms come from a cause. They don't create a cause. If you get a cold, you might develop a cough. The cough is the symptom. It came from the cold. We don't see, if I just start going, <coughs> <coughs> I just start coughing, I don't get a cold. That doesn't start a cold. That it doesn't lead to a cold. It's a symptom. Loving people doesn't, you don't will yourself into loving people and then all of a sudden, oh, like now that I love people, it doesn't work that way. Loving people is the symptom of loving Jesus. And so if you don't have it, you actually have a problem. Did, you see what I'm trying to say? So I'm not trying to guilt you and go, hey, you should love more people. It won't work. Jesus is actually going to tell a whole story about how impossible this becomes. Symptoms come from something else. So Jesus is going to uh, tell us this story, and here's what he's going to do. Because there's, the, man, I, everybody's got an idea of religion, of what it is, and, and it always gets really complex. Like everyone has all these rules and traditions and weird things that people add on to, to, to religions. You ever had someone tell you, you have to take your hat off when you pray? I actually still do that to this day. It's not in the Bible anywhere. I don't even know why I do it anymore. I just take it off. Jesus is going to cut through the complexity of your religious experience. He's going to absolutely cut right through complexity, and he's going to get to the heart of the gospel and the heart of religion and the heart of relationship with God. So let's, let's just go back, start at the top of the story, break this down together. Here's what it says. So Jesus is teaching, and there's all, the crowd sitting there, his disciples are there, but other people come to gather around, listen to him teach, and it says this, and behold, a lawyer. Now, the thing you need to know is this isn't a legal lawyer. This is actually a lawyer who studies God's law, he, 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 someone that specializes in God's law. And, and so the irony here is he's about to ask probably the most basic question to Jesus about the law, even though he's an expert. For a good reason, we'll see this. So 
behold, a lawyer stood up. Now, in the, in the cultural context of the way that they would teach in Israel, the teacher would stand and everyone that was submitting, wanted to learn under that teacher, would sit around them. So the fact that the, the lawyer is sitting and Jesus is teaching means that he was, in essence, submitting to this. But when he stands up, he's asserting now that he's not the student anymore. So he stands up to challenge Jesus with this question. And it says in here, to put him to the test. That's probably your translation says, put him to the test. Yes? Yeah, for the four of you that have text open? Okay, cool, cool. It's going great. Time change. I'll blame it on that. Test in Greek the, the, the word we read as test actually has a, a negative connotation. So test isn't even right, the word, right word exactly. Um, may, maybe another way to say that would be to trap him. So, so the lawyer wants to trap. Now, why does, a, why does a religious lawyer want to trap Jesus? Because Jesus has been going around the countryside from Galilee to Canaan, all these other places, and he's been preaching that the kingdom of God is coming and you can experience the kingdom of God now. Okay, that is a revolutionary concept in Israel, but it is personally offensive to someone who has studied their whole life about the law of God. Because he's built his career and his livelihood and his whole life and his whole identity on the law. Okay, you, you know somebody like this, okay? Uh, close your eyes. I want you to imagine this person. Maybe this used to be you. Close your eyes. I'm not going to teleport you anywhere. Close your eyes. Everybody knows somebody that believes that when they get to heaven, God is going to pull out the cosmic scales and they're going to weigh all of their good deeds on one side and all of their evil deeds on the other side. And there's going to be a balancing. And if they have more good deeds, they get to go to heaven. Everyone knows someone like that, right? Yes? Poppycock. It's baloney. But he believed this. He believed that, that the lawyer believes that, man, you gotta, you gotta follow all the laws. And they'd taken the Ten Commandments, they broke them into like 800 laws. You better follow them all. You better do them just right. If you don't do them just right, then you're not gonna get to heaven. And Jesus is running around going, you can experience the kingdom of God today. Well, that shouldn't be possible. How could you experience the kingdom of God today if we haven't been able to weigh all of your good deeds and your bad deeds? So he is not happy that Jesus is talking about liberty and freedom. Like, what are you talking about? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be serious about the law, Jesus, and you're not serious about the law. So he's gonna trap him. So here's the question. It's going to put him to the test. It's going to bait him to say something bad about the law. That's what he wants Jesus to do. He wants him to say something bad about the law because then I can catch him in blasphemy and we can put him on trial and we can out him because you're not serious about God's law. And Jesus, because he is a brilliant teacher and a brilliant storyteller, is actually going to trap this man who's trying to trap him in his own misconceptions. Just like he traps you and I oftentimes in our misconceptions about religion. And he says this. Here's a question he's going to trap Jesus with. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, well, here's a problem we have right off the bat. Do you see a problem with the, the, the question itself? Here, here's the problem. Uh, if you're, you have your text open, if you have your Bible open, I want you to underline the word do, and then I want you to underline the word inherit, okay? Because the problem is those words don't go together. How do you inherit something? You're related to the person that's giving it to you. If you're someone's child, tell me exactly what it is you did to become their child. Good deeds? Well, first of all, probably not. <laughs> Poor parents. Secondly, you didn't do anything. They did something. That's a sermon for another day. Um, you didn't do anything. You were born. Congratulations. You didn't do anything to inherit that. Like, what do you do to inherit eternal life? What kind of question is that? See, the whole reason that Jesus had to come in the first place is that in the Old Testament law, the, the practice of even trying to figure out how we have a relationship with God, because we broke the relationship in the Garden of Eden when sin entered this world. There was a whole series of laws. And, and, and if we're being super honest, if we read those laws, it was actually impossible to live them out Perfectly, And so Jesus is going to illustrate that in the story. So this question, what must I do to inherit? Like that was, 
That was probably a bad question back then, but today, what you and I know about Jesus going to the cross, dying for us, being raised again, ascending to heaven to reign at the right hand of the Father, that question is just silly. You can't do anything. You must instead believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord. That means repenting of who we were, turning away from that and accepting a gift of salvation from Jesus, following after him. When, when you put your faith in Christ, he adopts you into his family. You didn't do anything. He does the work. He did the work on the cross. He does the work when he saves you. And so when, when he adopts you, 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 you're inheriting these benefits because he adopted you. You became a son or a daughter of the king. And so, so we don't live life after that to, to, to earn heaven. We live life to figure out how to live life like a son or a daughter of the king. What does it look like to live with the very presence of God inside of us? Like we're learning new lifestyles when you come to Christ. So Jesus is going to answer this guy's question, this trap question, with a question. Jesus is really annoying that way. Like, don't play with Jesus. You ask him a trap question, he'll ask you another question back. That's what he does. Hey, how do I inherit eternal life? He says this, what is written in the law? How do you read it? You're a lawyer. That's, what, that's literally what he's saying. You're a lawyer, why don't you tell me? What's the law say? Why well, you need an answer? Okay, here's the lawyer. The lawyer like recites it. Everyone in that day would have been able to recite this. This is not just a lawyer thing. Uh, this was common. Here's what he recites, verse 27. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Okay, that is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 6.5. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 was a passage called the Shema and it summarized the first four of the Ten Commandments all in one little sort of phrase. So he's quoting Deuteronomy 6.5. It was, uh, you probably know, everyone here has heard of the Ten Commandments, right? I, just, I don't want to assume. Yes? Yeah? All, all seven of you? Okay, that's, that's all. Oh, thanks, yeah. Somebody in the back. Okay, you've heard of them. You probably don't remember them all. No one really does. Everyone thinks they do until they try to say them out loud. The first four of the Ten Commandments are all about us and God. They are about the vertical relationship between us and God. The next six of the Ten Commandments are about us and other people. So they're about horizontal relationships, things we should do or not do with other people. So the, this first portion, love the Lord, he's summarizing the first four, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. And then he's going to summarize the next six in just a moment. But, but, but I need you to see how silly this would look. This is a lawyer of the law. This guy's entire profession is studying the law. And he's asking Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? As if he doesn't already have an idea of what, you know, he, he knows what he believes. He's trying to get Jesus. And so Jesus says, how do you read the law? And he quotes off the most commonly taught phrase in the scripture at that time. Like, let me show you this guy. Uh, there was a picture, hold on. That's not a tiny top hat. That's called a phylactery. It's a box. It actually opens. It has stuff in it. Israelites, the really zealous ones like this guy, took scripture so seriously that where it says, I will write my words across your, your forehead and across your wrists. And so what they decided they would do is they'd take that literally. They built little tiny boxes called phylacteries, and they would take little fragments of scripture and stuff them inside and then take leather straps and tie them to their heads or their wrists and walk around. So, so he's quoting scripture that's probably stuck in a box on his head. Like, this is like the softball question, right? Like, this is like the easiest question ever that Jesus is asking him. Um, this would be like, does anyone remember the um, WWJD bracelets? Anybody here still remember those? Yeah. What would Jesus do? Like if you weren't certain, you just look at your wrist. Oh, what would Jesus do? First of all, you're not Jesus. Okay. That was a weird thing, weird phase for us. Um, what would Jesus do? He'd die on a cross. How about you? Okay. <clears throat> this would be like someone comes to you, right? And you've got your little WWJD bracelet on 
and you got your like not of this world sweatshirt and you're listening to Crowder and you got your red stickers on your Stanley cup and <laughs> just for, just for Instagram. Anyways, and someone's like, is there, any, is there any hope in this world? Listen, if you can't get that, if you can't get that question right, we're in real trouble, right? It's Jesus. Right? I mean, like, it's the easiest answer ever for this guy. He just quotes this. He's probably, this is, he's learned all this stuff. Well, how do you read the law? Well, love the Lord your God, all your strength, and all your soul, and all your mind, and all your heart. Like, and then he finishes it up by quoting Leviticus 19.18. And your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So these two scriptures in Deuteronomy and Leviticus were used to summarize all of these 800, 900 different laws, the Levitical laws and the laws of the temple, the sacrificial laws and the Ten Commandments. They, they kind of summed them all up and they, this was what was being taught in the first century. These two laws summed up all of the law. Now, I want you to just consider, this is before Jesus has gone to the cross, before the Holy Spirit, before the gospel. Let's just, just think about this. Who, who could love God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind? So no thought that enters your head is ever a thought that doesn't glorify and honor God, ever. <laughs> Impossible. Not possible. Like, it's just no one. No one could do that. In fact, in essence, what the law does by talking about your mind and your soul and your strength and your heart is really just calling out the fact of all the different ways that we wander away from God. So Jesus, Jesus hears him say that. Hey, here's these two verses. This is what we got to do. And Jesus goes, yeah, go do that. That's his answer. Yeah. Go do that and you will live. Verse 28. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. He, the quote that the guy, the, the scriptures the guy's quoting is exactly what Jesus quotes two other times in scripture when, when someone comes to him and says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? In Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, we have accounts of Jesus quoting this exact scripture. But I mean, he looks at the lawyer and he's like, yeah, now go get to it. You just quoted an impossible standard, now go do it. I mean, think back to your picture, right? You got this guy, little guy with, his, with a box on his head, with the scriptures on his forehead. Hey, what's the answer, Jesus? And he's like, you already know the answer. Go do it. Yeah, go live perfectly. Now, verse 29 in your Bible, Luke 10, verse 29, is the key to the whole story, to the whole illustration, to the whole parable, to what Jesus is trying to establish, not only with this guy, but with you in your life right now and as you live as a Christian. Verse 29. Here's what he says. But he, this is the lawyer, desiring to justify himself. He just double underlined justify. Said to Jesus, oh, and who is my neighbor? Now, the lawyer already recognizes that he cannot live out that law perfectly. He realizes, I have a, I have a problem. We don't use the word justify in, in modern language that often anymore, unless you use like Microsoft Word and you're trying to mess with margins. Anyways, um, it means to make right, to set right. So like if, uh, if you went to the, your barber or your hairdresser or whatever, and you, you, just, you ran a tab, like you didn't really pay them every time, you're like, oh, I'll catch, you know, catch up. And like the 25th time you went, they're like, look, I'm not gonna cut your hair. You, you owe me this massive debt for all these visits. You would have to justify yourself. You gotta make that right so you guys can have transactions. You guys can actually do business together because there's a debt that must be paid and it must be justified. Y'all see that? Okay. So, so the lawyer's saying, hold on, we can't leave it there. I mean, we can't leave it where I got to live perfectly. We have to love people perfectly. Can we split this into some smaller laws and give it some extra detail? Because then I can find some loopholes. Because that's what lawyers do. We find loopholes. That's what people do. We find loopholes. So he's like, no, 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 no. Um, here, let me, uh, sh surely I don't have to love everyone that way, 
that's impossible. Who's my neighbor? Because what, what is Jesus saying if we left it right here? If you want to get into heaven, if you want God to receive you, if you want to have a relationship with God, you have to obey the law perfectly. And the only way to obey the law perfectly, to fulfill that, would be to love everyone perfectly? Like, that would be a crushing answer. Like, do you realize the weight of that answer? That we would have to carry a burden on us that every thought, every action, every intention, every interaction with every person, including strangers, would have to be perfect love. Uh... Jesus, who's my neighbor? I go, Whoa. The lawyer already realizes what I hope you and I come to realize. See, I, I think well, he, he, what the lawyer realizes is the, 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 there's a gap, there's a problem where we can't meet this standard. And, and we would call that gap sin. Sin. Our disobedience to God, our inability to live in holiness like God lives our imperfection, we call that sin. And I believe, generally, if I just kind of sum this up in very broad terms, there are generally three reactions to sin in our world. Three common reactions. And I've labeled them creatively so that you'll remember them. The first way to react to sin is what I like to call the American way. We all like America, right? I mean, sorry, America, right? Oh, we don't need the A. America. We like America. Two of you like America. You, you anti-patriots, you fascists. America, the American way. Here's what we do with sin in the American way. We ignore it. <laughs> we just pretend it's not there, and we fill our lives up with as much noise, as much entertainment, as much busyness, as much kids' sports as possible, and stress ourselves out about it so we don't have to have any quiet or any time to meditate and think about the fact that there is a serious problem in our souls. So we'll just stay busy. And if we're not staying busy, then we'll stay medicated or we'll stay drunk or we'll stay on some sort of substance because the last thing I want to do is I, I don't want to think about that problem because, man, that would take me to the deepest and darkest of places in my soul. So the American way is don't think about it. Go to Vegas. Don't think about it. Go to Disneyland. Don't think about it. Ring up a bunch of debt on that credit card so that you have something going on in your life so you don't have to consider where you're spending eternity. The American way. The second way we can think about this is the gospel way. The gospel way. The gospel way is God's formula to deal with the problem of imperfection in which he sends his son Jesus as an intercessor. An intercessor means someone that comes in on our behalf and goes, you can't handle it, but I can handle it. So Jesus is going to come and make a way as a substitute to justify us by going to the cross and paying our debt for us. That's the gospel. Jesus is gonna do something so radical on the cross that every time we think about it, we're going to realize not only that we cannot live up to it, we're going to realize that the amount of grace and mercy that he gave and extended to us changes everything in our lives. It leads us to gospel principle number one. I mentioned there'd be a couple. Gospel principle number one. Tim Keller puts it this way. Real love doesn't begin until you see that you can't really love. Put another way, you're incapable of real love until you see that you are incapable of real love. If that sounds contradictory, welcome to humanity. Now, maybe you've been to church a while and you're like, I, that seems counterintuitive. Like, oh, that sounds intuitive. Like, we already know that. No, no, you don't know that. In fact, the population doesn't know that. In fact, most of humanity doesn't think that. Gallup did a poll, 90% of Americans think that they love more than the average person. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're loving. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty loving. I'm love, more loving than the average person. You're lying. You don't know. We all know. We do know this. We all know that loving others is something we're supposed to do. That's not even religious. That's baked into your DNA. You know you should do it. But it's very, very hard. And if you haven't realized you can't do it yet, you might not really know Jesus. 
you might still be deluding yourself. Now, the third way, we'll talk about the gospel way more in a minute. The third way we deal with sin is what we see here, the Jewish way, what this lawyer was doing, a.k.a. the American Christian way. So this is what has infiltrated into our churches over the course of the last 100 or 200 years. This is what Christians do when we lose sight of the gospel or when we've actually never been saved, we just got religion instead of Jesus. Here's what we do. This is very common. We've all done this at some point. We lower the standard. I love to tell uh, people, listen, we can have a great relationship, but we just lower the expectations. <laughs> you know? We lower the standard. What's the best way that I can meet the goal? Lower the goal. Don't ask me to be perfect. Let's just make the goal low. Like, that's what the lawyer's trying to do. Jesus is like, yes, love perfectly, live perfectly. And the lawyer's like, uh, who's my neighbor? Like, let's lower that standard down a little bit. He wants Jesus to give him a loophole. Surely this can't be the actual standard because that would be impossible. <laughs> now, I just want you to uh, think of the irony. We're only a couple verses in and Jesus has already completely turned this lawyer on his head. He came because he thought Jesus didn't really care about holiness. He didn't really care about God's law. And now Jesus has this guy backtracking trying to find loopholes already. Like Jesus is like, I care so much about the law. I care so much about holiness. You can't handle the fact that I, that I want to live this way and I believe this is the standard. You're already trying to find loopholes. Who's the, who's the laissez-faire, flippant guy about the law now, Mr. Lawyer? So Jesus is going to answer the question of who is my neighbor with a story, because that's what Jesus does. You want a direct answer? Let me tell you a story. Here you go, verse 30. And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, technically, he was traveling north to get to Jericho. But he says down because Jerusalem was on a mountain, and you would go down 3,000 feet. That was the drop to get to Jericho. It was about a 17-mile trip down an incredibly treacherous terrain, really common to be robbed on that road because people could hide all over the place. And so uh, if you're thinking about what's a 3,000-foot drop in 17 miles, it's basically the top of the grapevine to the Tahone outlets. You're dropping about 3,000 feet in 17 miles, except if you don't get to drive it, you got to walk it. And he's probably picking this path as the story because it was really common for religious leaders to live in Jericho. So they would leave the temple in Jerusalem and they'd go back to Jericho and robbery was rampant on this path. It'd be like going to the worst area of town at 3 a.m. and stopping and unlocking all your doors and asking everyone for directions. Not smart, right? Okay, so, so the whole crowd can visualize exactly what he's saying, especially the lawyer. He says this, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest would be the highest religious office of that time, the guy who's supposed to be the standard for holiness. Now, maybe the priest was uh, worried about, you know, being unceremonially clean. They weren't allowed to touch dead bodies, right? So they give his whole excuse about, well, you know, it was... he was coming from Jerusalem and going home. He didn't even have that concern. That wasn't even an excuse. Verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by the other side. A Levite was like an associate priest. He would be like the second highest holy position in that time. So he picked the two, two religious elite positions. Both of them see the need, see the person, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Then he paid his own money to the innkeeper. And then he said, whatever you spend extra, I'll pay that too. Verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? Verse 37, the lawyer is trapped now. He's got no choice. The man who showed mercy. Jesus gives him, I want you to see this, the same answer he started with. You go and do likewise. Okay, uh, real quick, you need to understand Samaritans. It is very, very critical to understand why Jesus 
picking a Samaritan in this story is like twisting the knife. Uh, Jesus has told uh, the perfect sort of trifold story of that time. This was, a, this was something they did in, in, in Greek literature a lot and in the time. So he's got three characters, and the first two are these religious elite that, by the way, were not really popular with the people at all. So the commoner didn't like either of these two types of individuals. They were very arrogant. They lorded over others. Um, they were just very pompous. And they, the crowd is all expecting the third character of the story, the hero that shows up, to be a common Jewish worker. Like, so, someone like a fisherman or a tent maker. Like that, that's who's supposed to be the hero. Because he just set up the, the arrogant guys to take the fall, right? And he's going to come through with like this good old carpenter. He's going to come in and save the day. And then he says Samaritan, and everyone's like, ugh. Why? Because they hate Samaritans. I mean, they hate Samaritans. For lots of reasons. Number one, over 400 years earlier, when the Assyrians had conquered the nation, Samaritans were the group of people that decided to intermarry with the conquerors, and, and, and that, which, was, which was very sinful. God was like, don't intermarry. You're supposed to only marry inside the Hebrew nation. They married outside the nation. And so from then on, Israelites have treated them like an entire different ethnicity. They have looked down their nose at them. Uh, they excluded them from helping to build the temple in Jerusalem and then said, you can't worship here. So, so Samaritans, in response, because they were excluded from not only participating in the temple, but from worshiping, built their own temple on a different mountain. That's how separate this nation is. But they're right next to each other. They were one nation. Samaritans now have a different economy, different politics. They're looked at as a different culture, different race. <laughs> like They are completely separate, even though they're right there, and Jews hate them. They, in fact, they hate them so much that in the Jewish culture, they couldn't associate with them. They couldn't touch them. They couldn't use the same utensils as them. Like, they were ostracized. So if the roles were reversed, if the injured man was a Samaritan, every Jew would have felt fully justified walking by and not helping that person. So, 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 a Jew would have looked at a Samaritan and they would have said, I, I, there would have been cultural bias. You can call that racism if you want. Like, there's no way I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with them as an ethnicity. Political bias, I don't believe in their politics. I don't believe in what they're for. I don't believe in what they stand for. Religious bias, they built their own temple. They don't worship like we do. I'm not even sure they worship the same God as we do. So they have cultural bias, political bias, religious bias. And they would have walked right by. The good news for you and I is that in 2024, culture, politics, and religion never get in the way of us loving people. Jesus has crafted a story to explain biblical compassion with kingdom values. And he takes a person who is being mistreated and discriminated against for their culture, for their ethnicity, for their politics, for their religion. And he makes him the hero. Not perfect, not sinless. That's not what he does. But he makes him the hero. He is twisting the knife to make an example here. Do, do, He's looking at us and saying, if you can't love people in spite of their culture or their ethnicity, in spite of their politics, in spite of their religion, then you're missing the perfect standard of the law. You can't love perfectly. The Samaritan not only is the one that stops, he does two things that we hate doing. He spends his own time and his own money on the wounded man. So I just, if you were to summarize this little story, you would say this. The Samaritan looks beyond culture, politics, and religion. He sees need, and he meets that need with his time and his money. So Jesus looks back at the lawyer, and he says, who proved to be a neighbor? That's an interesting way to phrase that question. You can't earn salvation. You can't earn eternal life, which is what the guy was asking, but you can prove to be a neighbor. 
So the lawyer stops justifying. He faces the truth. He says, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus gives him the same answer. Now go and do it. So we already agreed it was impossible. But this standard makes the law worse. The story makes the standard worse. Like before it was just love others and you just thought about like someone you should love. But now all of a sudden we took the worst of the worst of the worst. And we said, love them like yourself. How, how, how do you do that? And this is where we get to gospel principle number two. You see, if real love only starts when we realize we're incapable of real love, gospel principle number two says real love begins when you see Christ's love for you. When you see Christ's love for you, it took Christ to even for us to even have a chance at getting here. It's Jesus talking about kingdom values. Before he goes to the cross, he's talking about this. But after Jesus goes to the cross, if we're to turn to the rest of the New Testament, the Bible will actually talk about this a lot. L listen to how much worse it gets. If you thought this sandwich was bad, listen to Philippians 2, verse 3. Paul says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Well, before it was just treat them like I wanted to be treated. Now I got to treat them better than me. Seven times in the New Testament, the Bible will tell us that if we love God, we will love others. It won't say should. So it's not saying, if you love God, you should love others. It's saying, if you love God, you will love others. It's telling you, loving others in this biblical way, in this selfless way, is a symptom of loving God. It will be produced in your life. And if it's not, that should be a massive warning in your life. I want to remind you before another election cycle, before you waste hours on social media or corporate news channels, and you begin to demonize people who are different than you, that the Bible says there are only two types of people in this world, those who are born again in Christ and those who are dead in sin. Amen. When you get to heaven, they're not going to split you up, Republican and Democrat. They're not going to split you up by ethnicity or culture. They're not going to split you up by any of those things. There are only two types of people. You either know Jesus or you're dead in your sins. So don't lay the morals on dead people. They don't need your laws. They can't follow them anyways. They're dead. They're dead. We have a lot of instruction in the New Testament about how to deal with each other as believers. So a lot of, of, of stuff in the New Testament about church life, living with other Christians, the, the, the conflict, the unity, I mean, how to do all these things. There's not actually a ton in the New Testament about unbelievers. Most everything written in the New Testament about how we treat unbelievers is this. We try to reach them with the truth by any means possible. And our urgency should be so extreme that the, the, the way the Bible would put it is, is like controversial, honestly. Like Pastor Craig Rochelle says it this way. He says, uh, we will do anything short of sin to reach people for Christ. And people thought that was really controversial. If you think that's controversial, you should read 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. If it were not written in the Bible and you read that out loud in most churches, they would tell you you were heretical. It's extreme. Here's what Paul says. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. We all love being a servant of everybody else, right? That's what you were hoping to do at church today that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself, uh, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, so those didn't follow the uh, Israelite way, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, so he didn't go misbehave, but being under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means, I might save some. 
I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in the blessings. If that were not in the Bible, and you said that in a lot of churches, they'd be like, no, 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 no way. We can't lose blank tradition, right? Like, it's extreme, it's urgent. Souls are on the line. If people's eternal lives are on the line, how come we don't act like it? How come we don't live like it? How come we don't prepare like it? How come it doesn't burn us up like people are about to be in hell for eternity? How come we're okay with it? So the second principle is, real love begins when you see Christ's love for you. Jesus is saying, and this is his whole point to the lawyer, when he keeps saying, like, go and do it, he's trying to get the lawyer to see, you're spiritually bankrupt. You can't do it. He needs the lawyer. Lawyer's almost there. He needs the lawyer to go, I can't do that. That's why I'm looking for loopholes. I can't do that. Jesus is saying, you're spiritually bankrupt, but I have justified you. So you don't have to stand up anymore and look for loopholes and justify yourself because I did it on the cross. So instead of needing to justify to ourselves why we won't reach certain people in our lives, why, why, why we would look at someone and go, well, I can't associate with them you know, because they're, they're a Democrat or they're a Republican or they're a Muslim or they're gay or worse, a Raiders fan. <laughs> or any other reason that I might use to justify my unloving, cold heart. Jesus will justify us so we can love people greatly. Amen. The kind of love that comes from a sinner saved by grace. That, that story of the Samaritan is fictional if not for a sinner saved by grace. People are either saved or they aren't. And if they aren't, our hearts should break over people possibly going to hell. People living in this world without the hope of Christ, that should break us, that should motivate us. And that comes back to this idea about reaching people in our circles. The desire to reach people is a natural symptom of loving Jesus and lacking it should alarm us. Um, someone asked me recently, we were at this conference and they were like, hey, what are the goals for your church? You know? And uh, we have goals. Like if you read our vision statement, you know, we have like specific goals for each one of these things about things that we want our church to achieve. Uh, but but look, I didn't, that's not what I told them. I told them about my dreams for Res, uh, Res Church. Because I, I dream about a Bakersfield that is so flooded with the love of Christ through you that it changes the economy of this town. Where, where strip clubs have to close down because there are no customers showing up. Where people, anyone who needs a place to live can find shelter and is not out on the street. Where Little League stops scheduling things on Sunday because no one will show up because no one could imagine losing out on the encouragement of going to church in order for their kids to go play in a sport that they're not going pro in anyways. This whole city being changed because you can't stop talking about what Jesus is doing in your life and you won't shut up and it's a little bit annoying, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. Amen. Th that's how revival starts, is we actually begin thinking about the eternal like it's coming and man, I don't want my neighbor to miss it. If everyone in this church brought one person to church on Easter, we would barely be able to hold you and we would love it. But if we don't have an urgency to share a joy that should be inside of us, that should be a huge red flag. We should be so concerned by why we don't have that. I remember early on um, as I got trained up in the church and it was just kind of a lifestyle thing. Um, like, oh, dude, religion can really mess you up. I, I used to think I was really special. I, like I had figured out the God thing early on and being a Christian was really about being a good person and going to church occasionally and then sometimes making sure that everyone else knew about what I'd accomplished being a good person. 
which essentially means I was the lawyer. I had lowered the standard and I thought that I was hitting it. I wasn't a good person. I was just lowering the standards to meet my narcissism and my ego. I just sat in self-righteousness, feeling like I was justified. Um, and, and maybe you have gone through that as well. But listen, until we can reach the end of ourselves and get to the point where we go, I give up. Like, I cannot, dude. I realize there's no way. I can't live a perfect moral life. I can't love people well. I would be lying to myself. And it is only when I get to the end of myself when Jesus finally stepped in and I could hear the thing that he had been saying the whole time. He justified me because he was good, not me. He's righteous, not me. He loved perfectly, not me. He loved you, which I could never do. He loves me, which, if we're honest, you could never do. And then in time, as I begin to experience, experience the joy of knowing him, would you just get to sit and, and think about what it took for him to go to the cross for you? Why he would love you that greatly? Just to sit in his mercy and his grace to be loved that well as people that he died to save. We will love people who make us uncomfortable because we'll see them the way God sees us. I believe the greatest evangelistic work is a blend of our sweat and Jesus' blood. We work to share what he did. Now, I think there's three types of people sitting in the room today. Um, and I want to address each of you. individually. It's your job to figure out which of the three you are. Number one, I think there are people here that genuinely want to reach others, but maybe you don't know how, maybe you're scared, but you want to. Like you, you have that urgency, you, have, you, you feel like you need to do it. Number two, I think people here who know Jesus, like you know you, Jesus, but you have no desire, if we're being honest, to reach other people. And then number three, I think there are people in this room that don't know Jesus. And, and if you'll stay with me for the last couple moments of this sermon, I have something for each of you, which, which, wherever you fall in those three. If you want to reach people, but, 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 but you feel like, oh, I got to get better at it or you're, or you're scared to do it. I had someone come up to me after first service and they were like, yo, but like it's happening. Like, I'm, like people are asking me and I don't know what to tell them. Like they're scared. They're scared. Here's what I would tell you. Um, first of all, the fact that you have a desire to love other people, you should thank God that he has changed you. That is supernatural. That is a miracle. That is not normal. And it's awesome. But if you're struggling at sharing, I just, let me encourage you uh, with this. Most gospel conversations with people at the gym, at work, your neighbor, whatever, most gospel conversations, they start with about 20 seconds of awkward. Like to, to, to turn a conversation spiritual, yes, there's a gap. It's about 20 seconds. It's not forever. It's not a 10-minute awkward conversation, but 20 seconds of awkward. It's like a junior higher asking someone to dance, right? So it's just about 20 seconds of like, ugh, it's not as bad as you think we write terrible stories in our head. And here's why. Be because most people, when you get down to it, want to be prayed for. They want to be encouraged. They actually want to know that there's hope in this world because it looks hopeless. It's our job to embrace that awkward, to change that conversation to something of depth, to lead with vulnerability so that it's okay to talk. Here's a simple way to start that conversation. I learned this from my dad. You ask them this, hey, when you get the opportunity, where do you go to church? Well, it's very low barrier, right? It's not assuming they do or don't. Just, hey, when you get the opportunity, where do you go? Or, or, listen, you can simply start talking about what Jesus is doing in your life. Hey, this is what's happening to me. I don't even have answers for it. I can't even explain it, but let me just tell you what Jesus is doing. Force them to respond to your joy. That is an awesome way to start an awkward conversation. Force them to respond to your joy. Lastly, if, if you're interested, 
Like you, you know you need to get better. You, you want to be prepared to talk to people, to, to, to be uh, uh, sensitive to when there's an opportunity for gospel conversation. On Saturday, there is a gospel evangelism conference at Valley Baptist. We're going to take dozens of people from this church to work on our evangelism, how we can practically meet needs and talk to people about the gospel. That's on Saturday. You can, you can walk out these doors and talk to Karen and she'll sign you up for that. It's free. Number two, maybe you're not in a group, that, that classification of people that, that desire to reach people and care for people. Maybe when you're being really honest, and hey, we are in church, uh, when you're being really honest, you have little desire to reach people. It's not a lack of gifting. It's not a season. It's not someone else's job. You're not too busy. I'm, and I, and I, please don't feel guilty. Guilt is a terrible motivator. You, you should instead, if you have no desire to reach people with a joy or love of Christ, you should take that as a warning in your own life that you aren't overwhelmed and in awe of Jesus and his saving you. But when I don't want to reach people with a life transformation of the gospel, that means I've become lukewarm. It actually means I've stopped loving God with all of my heart and soul and strength and mind. It means I'm the problem. And I need to read gospel myself. I need to gaze into the beauty of what God has done for me. I need to remember who I was before Christ met me and saved me. I need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on my life to remind me what he has done for me and what he's doing for me now. It means I've lost the joy of his presence and I need to cry out for that again. Now, if that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity when the elders and the prayer team come down here. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Just come to the altar and ask him to pour his spirit out on you, to reignite and stir up that passion in your life for what he's done for you so that it will spill over onto other people. He will change your heart to love people. And if you don't believe that, just ask him. He saved you and he will light a fire in you to reach others too. Number three, the third type of person, maybe you are a person here today that has never put their faith in Jesus. So there's no joy from him to share. You're still carrying the burden of an impossible standard on your shoulders. And you're either covering it up or you're trying to justify yourself by lowering the standard. And you need to give your life to Christ today. So we're going to do this in our last moments here today before we leave. Will you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm not asking you to do that for any religious tradition. I'm asking you to do that to just concentrate for just a minute on yourself and not anybody else. Just you. If you have never put your full faith in Jesus Christ and surrendered to your life to him, I want to offer you the chance to do that today, not tomorrow. Will you give your life to him? No one else's faith can save you, only you. If you are willing to ask him for forgiveness and salvation with every eye closed and every head bowed, just quietly, even silently, say this prayer with me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I am lost on my own and I can't save myself. I know I'm incapable of loving perfectly. I want you to save me. I give over everything I am to you. In full confidence, I receive your promise of relationship, of forgiveness of sin, of the Holy Spirit, of eternal life. Be my Lord, please, Jesus. With every eye closed, with no one looking up, if you prayed that prayer for the first time ever, will you be brave and raise your hand right now? Amen. All right, look at me. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you more than you understand. And the whole point of this story is you don't really understand how much he loves you. 
Everyone's going to stand up real quick. Rachel's going to play a song. If you need prayer for any reason, our elders and our prayer team are going to be up here. We want to pray for you. If you want to come to the altar and ask God to stir up your affection for him, this altar is open. If you prayed that prayer a moment ago for the first time, there's a table in the back. Mark is standing by. We have a gift for you. We'd love to give it to you. We'd love to talk to you about next steps. And for those of you that are going to sign up for the evangelism conference, you can do that as soon as we end out in the lobby with Karen. We're going to reach this city for Christ, not because we're good, but because he is. He is mercy and grace and goodness. You move as the Lord leads you.